Hi everyone, it's Katrina. From entire naval battles in the Colosseum to some questionable hygienic habits, here are nine of the craziest things the Romans did, because it was time for a remake. Number 9. Colosseum Ship Battles The ancient Romans built the Colosseum as the world's largest amphitheater and the centerpiece for the ancient city of Rome. Construction began in 70 AD under the Emperor Vespasian. It took 10 years to complete and had its opening ceremony in 80 AD. This ceremony was so impressive that it went on for 100 days. Have you ever been to the Colosseum or is it on your bucket list? Let me know in the comments below. The Colosseum could fit up to 80,000 spectators. Can you imagine that many people back then? Even now, many stadiums seat around 70,000 to 100,000 people. So 80,000 people 2,000 years ago is super impressive. While the Colosseum is most famous for its bloody gladiator battles, it was used for a lot more than that. One of the craziest things the Romans did with the Colosseum was to fill the entire thing with water and then actually hold mock navy battles inside. Known as Naumachia, the Romans would take prisoners of war or convicts and force them to fight like gladiators, but instead they would fight each other on small ships until one side was destroyed. They would use models of ships scaled down to fit and leave an island in the middle for the sailors to land and then fight it out to the death. The earliest pretend naval battle like this on record was in 46 BC, when Julius Caesar built an artificial lake and had an Egyptian and Tyrian fleet fight it out in front of spectators. But doing this in the Colosseum doesn't really give you that much space. And how do you get the water to stay in there? A complex hydraulic system helped supply water to the Colosseum, but historians still can't quite figure out how the Romans organized these totally bizarre battles. Not a single piece of physical evidence of the Colosseum ship battles has ever been found. However, they have been described by many witnesses and ancient authors, so they are extremely well documented. This incredible feat of engineering was just one of many special events held in the Colosseum to entertain the masses. The Colosseum was used for almost 400 years. At least 400,000 people lost their lives in this amphitheater alone, along with one million animals. Number 8. The Blood Cure Speaking of gladiators, ancient Romans between the 1st and 6th century believed that draining the blood of gladiators and then drinking it could cure things, such as epilepsy. In fact, the use of gladiators' blood as a magical cure went on for hundreds of years during the Roman Republic. Gladiator fights were eventually outlawed in the year 325 AD, when Emperor Constantine I converted to Christianity and said that the fights to the death had no place during a time of civil and domestic peace. The barbaric fun was over, so people began to drink the blood of an executed individual instead, especially one that had been beheaded, since that was the next best thing. Because some people with epilepsy or fits recovered, physicians believed that the cure actually worked. Some modern textbooks on medicine report that as late as the 20th century, people still believed in the ancient magical practice of drinking the blood of a gladiator or a gladiator-like person to cure ailments. Gladiator blood wasn't the only thing that Romans thought would cure them. They also had a hunger for raw human livers as a way to treat medical issues. Apparently, executioners would have to fight back sick people who were trying to steal newly executed dead bodies because they wanted to harvest the livers to cure their diseases. Something that made this craze even worse was that seizures come and go, meaning that a lot of people would be convinced that they were cured after drinking blood or eating a liver and not experiencing a seizure for a long period of time. The frenzy for fresh blood and liver comes from the Roman belief that young and healthy males possess huge quantities of energy and that by harnessing that energy at the point of death, you could absorb that person's healthiness. There were other beliefs during Roman times as well, such as that drinking gold would make the body indestructible. But of course, drinking gold was toxic and would basically just destroy your kidneys. Number 7. Poison Immunity Betrayal, assassination, and death by poison were all things that ancient Roman emperors and politicians had to worry about. They were constantly under threat and in need of better methods for protecting themselves and holding on to their power. Some believed that the best way to avoid being poisoned was to drink as many poisons as possible to become immune. 
They believed that by subjecting themselves purposely to dangerous poisons little by little, they could gain immunity and not have to worry so much about getting killed by their enemies, although they still had to worry about getting stabbed in the back. But anyway, the most famous king who tried to do this was Mithridates VI, who ruled over a small kingdom near Rome. Not only did he hire a taste tester to first check his food for poison, but he also slowly accustomed himself to being poisoned. He was traumatized by the death of his father who was killed in 120 BC by poison given to him during a feast. Mithridates VI decided he would never die like his father, and so he was careful to ingest doses that were just below the level of lethality. He believed that the constant exposure would give him superpowers, and to be honest, it doesn't seem that crazy of an idea, does it? He also had to worry about his mother trying to kill him. When his father died, his mother Laodice VI took over and wanted his younger brother to take the throne. Mithridates VI went into hiding, carefully consuming poison until he could raise an army and take over. When he lived in the wilderness, the story goes he was helped by Scythian shamans, who helped him come up with the formula that would make him immune to many poisons. He successfully seized the throne and had his mother and brother arrested and executed. At first, he was on friendly terms with the Romans, but things eventually turned sour as he kept expanding and conquering neighboring kingdoms. After many wars, the Romans considered him a threat and eventually forced him to flee. Rather than fall into enemy hands, he decided to commit suicide by drinking poison. It didn't go so well because he actually was immune and he didn't die. The ironic twist of fate. He was eventually caught and soon ripped apart by angry rebels. During this time, Rumors spread of the semi-mythical concoction that would make you immune to any poison or serve as an antidote. This became known as a Mithridate or Mithridati in honor of Mithridates VI, and during the Middle Ages and the Renaissance, it became a highly sought-after drug, even though no one really knew exactly what was in it. Number 6. Roman Beauty Beauty was wildly important to ancient Roman women, and things haven't changed much in the past 2,000 years. They used makeup and beauty products to the same extent that people do today. The only difference was the types of ingredients. One of the most popular beauty products was the beauty mask. These masks were usually a rather disgusting mixture of sweat from sheep's wool, animal urine, bile, ground oyster shells, and even fresh placenta. Mmm, so relaxing! But before you go denouncing the Romans for being gross, some of these ingredients are still used today in beauty masks. They also wore tons of perfume, obviously to cover the stench of all of these ingredients. Another popular beauty practice was bathing in donkey milk. People would also whiten their skin using animal dung, smelly, and lead, which was toxic. Swan fat was used to get rid of wrinkles. Burnt cork was used as a lash thickener. Long lashes were also a way to tell the world that you practice chastity, as women who were a little more risque were believed to have eyelashes that always fell out. Dark eyebrows, preferably a unibrow, were all the rage. They wore nail polish and kept their nails short, and white teeth were prized possessions. Even if they weren't your own, they could be made from bone, ivory, and paste. After Cleopatra visited Rome in 46 BC, she greatly influenced Roman makeup. Cleopatra wore red ochre on her lips, green eyeshadow made from malachite, blue eyeshadow made from lapis stone, and black coal for her eyes. Red lips especially became a huge sensation. All the Roman women began using Betelgeuse and bromine to make their lips as red as possible. Number 5. The Horse Politician The Roman Emperor Caligula loved one of his horses so much that according to the ancient historian Suetonius, he planned to make the horse consul and have a say in government. But did he really do it? The horse named Incitatus received an ivory manger, a marble stall, a collar made from jewels, and his own house. The servants would feed the animal oats blended with flakes of gold. Caligula is one of the most notorious emperors in Roman history, known for his madness and brutality. When he first came to power, he was beloved, but he got sick with a mysterious illness and was never the same. He became cruel and crazy feeding prisoners to wild beasts because he was bored, sleeping with other men's wives, declaring he was a god, speaking with the moon, wasting money and causing starvation. There are many stories. It's hard to separate fact from fiction since many of the authors hated him or wrote down rumors, but he did often try to humiliate members of the Senate, and appointing his horse as consul was the ultimate insult. 
A consul was the highest elected political office between 509 and 27 BC. If successful, Caligula would have created the first equine official in Rome. Some historians have suggested that Caligula was in fact trying to embarrass and humiliate the senators and the other elite members of the political circus in Rome by giving his horse a higher position of public office than them. In a way, he wanted to show that his horse was more important than the meaningless and useless senators, and that their job was so easy, even a horse could do it. So was he crazy or a political mastermind? It looks like the former. His constant mocking and evil ways became the death of him, and he was murdered by officers within his own guard. Incitatus was not officially granted his position. Number 4. The Roman Banquet The Roman Banquet was probably just the way you would imagine it today in your mind. Picture Romans in togas stretched out on long chairs with goblets of wine and dozens upon dozens of exotic foods being served literally on silver platters. But while there's nothing inherently crazy about the excess of the ancient Roman banquet, just wait until you hear exactly what kinds of food these people were eating, from peacock tongue to fried dormice, which was actually a fat little mouse. Keep in mind that these banquets reached their peak between 98 and 117 AD, at a time when the Roman Empire stretched from Baghdad to Britain. Foods and animals would come from all over. Many of these banquets were excellent opportunities for someone to poison one of their enemies by slipping something into their wine. These really were the wildest and most elite parties of the time. Plus, you could show off your power and wealth. Some of the weirder dishes that would be served at a Roman banquet were wild sow's udders, stuffed snails, not so bad, ostrich, and sugarcane, that sounds nice. One of the only surviving cookbooks from the Roman Empire, written by Marcus Scavius Apicius, details at least 400 recipes, including some for camel heels, parrot, pheasant, rabbit, sausages made from brain, flamingo tongues, and so much more. Basically, if you want to learn how to cook like the Romans, you can. Number 3. The Lady Gladiators Not many people know the truth about gladiators. Gladiators were not strictly male, nor were they always prisoners forced to fight to the death. A lot of gladiator battles didn't even end in death. And for that matter, there were elite gladiator women known as gladiatrix. The beginnings for gladiator women were definitely a bit dubious. Because male gladiators fought shirtless, it was decreed that the women would also fight shirtless. This began as more of a humorous spectacle for a largely male audience. The female gladiators would still fight with swords and shields, but they would usually be set against enemies with a rather dwarf-like stature so that the audience would laugh. But they weren't laughing for long. Female gladiators began to be taken seriously, and they also fought against other, even more ferocious female gladiators and wild animals. They became a rare breed of brutal warrior women. Later on, they were known as Amazons in the events, and would sometimes fight from a cart or a chariot. And here's the other thing about gladiators. Some of those who signed up to fight in the Colosseum were people from the middle class who wanted to earn extra money. The prize for winning a gladiator tournament was enormous and it often came with a quick 15 minutes of fame. Before female gladiator battles were eventually outlawed, many of the most skilled and fearsome warriors in the arena were middle-class women collecting serious bank. This allowed many of the gladiatrix to move away from their fathers or husbands and live alone in prosperity. They were by no means common, but were a shocking and rare event to witness for the Roman public. Number 2. Roman Toilets Ancient Rome was not known for its hygiene, especially if you needed to use the toilet. At one point, there were 144 public latrines in Rome. These communal bathrooms were set up with toilets in rows next to each other, and it was actually a whole experience. People would go to sit and read, share stories, give out dinner invitations, what have you. The toilets, of course, didn't flush, but they were tied into internal plumbing and sewer systems with running water underneath them. As you can imagine, because so many people were hanging out in public toilets as if they were at the local pub, they weren't that sanitary. Instead of using toilet paper, Romans used a shared sponge for wiping their behinds. Of course, rinsed out in a bucket of vinegar or salt water after each use, to be polite to the next person. Public urinals were a little different. Buckets from these urinals were regularly collected to be used at the laundromat. Why? Because pee is actually an excellent detergent. Collectors had public contracts to go around town collecting all the urine which would then be used to clean the clothes. They would soak the clothes in pee and stomp on it with their feet. 
Don't worry, they would put all kinds of perfumes and things on it afterwards. Actually, the ancient Romans used human and animal urine on a pretty daily basis. Whereas we in modern times are grossed out by the smallest splash of urine, Romans also used urine as mouthwash. Just like with the laundry, because urine contains ammonia, something used today in commercial cleaning products, it was effective at removing dirt from a person's teeth. It did, in fact, make Roman teeth whiter. Please don't try this at home. This is for educational purposes only. Number 1. Romans and Elephants The Romans had an obsession with war elephants. It all started in 280 BC when the Egyptian pharaoh Ptolemy II lent out some elephants to King Pyrrhus of Epirus, a Greek kingdom. King Pyrrhus then used his new elephants to attack the Romans, resulting in a massive victory. This time, the Romans had no idea how to defend against elephants. But the next time that the Romans were attacked by elephants, they were prepared. They threw pots of fire to scare the beasts, they had special anti-elephant war devices, and they defeated them pretty easily the second time around. Romans then got their own elephants after 275 BC, when the Pyrrhic War came to an end. They definitely recognized their military potential. The Romans took on this powerful animal and used them in many military campaigns. The story goes that they also brought an elephant when they invaded Britain. The Britons didn't exactly communicate with faraway lands and none of them knew what an elephant was. When they first saw the giant beast covered with armor carrying archers and a tower on its back, they fled, allowing the Romans to cross over. I don't blame them. It must have looked like an army of aliens accompanied by mythical beasts. Suffice it to say, the Romans eventually took over Britain. Thanks for watching! What did you think was the craziest thing? What is something that you would try today? Let me know in the comments below and be sure to hit that subscribe button if you haven't already. See you soon! Bye!